Real quick, who are we? Um, this is Adam Casella. Say hi, Adam. What's going on? How are you? So I'm Glenn Sullivan. So we were co-founders of SnapRoute. Um, Adam's the CTO as well. I don't have a cool title yet. We're working on it. Um, <laughs> so we were uh, network engineers at Apple. We were building the really, really large data centers at Apple that control the you know things that you use as a consumer, your iTunes, iCloud, Maps, Siri, all that, all that good jazz. So we got to experience scale. Um, like, most people have never seen, um, but a lot of the people in the room have. Yep. Uh, the cool thing while we were there, though, is we got to see this hockey stick growth of uh, something called iCloud when it came out, and someone stood on stage and said, hey, it's free. So that's the number of users that go up when you say, hey, it's free, and it works on everything. Uh, you, know, you, you can imagine the kind of scale challenges we had to deal with. Um, we also have been using white box stuff from the beginning. Uh, you know, the early days of Oni, the early days of some of the disag you know, folks out there, the early days of ONL. So we're, we've been in this space for a long time, and we've learned a lot as we've went along. Uh, also, little keynote from us, uh, we have a kind of a weird background. It's, by the way, the same. We both worked at Apple. We both were tech engineers at Cisco before that. So we kind of have this dual duality where we know the vendor side, and oh gosh, everything's breaking every, every three seconds, and then oh, I've got to keep this network up and then go tell my VPs why I'm sorry about the corner case that we hit. So we've, we've got this kind of duality of experience, which is kind of fun. A uh, little bit about SnapRoute. I promise I will keep the marketing stuff very, very short because I've been told many, many times you guys love that sort of thing. Uh, we were founded in 2015 uh, in August. You know, after we spun out of Apple, we, you know, we were learning the challenges there. Um, with all the solutions that were out there, we really wanted to focus on how to solve the gaps in, in what we were trying to do from a visibility perspective and from an operational control perspective. Um, the cool thing about what we're doing that we think is very different is we're not, a, we're not really you know, another um, spin out from one of the traditional OEM vendors, right? We're not just a little team that's tried to go do a startup and then get pulled back in. So we're not a bunch of folks that have just built network operating systems and control plane protocols and everything else, we've, we're, we're operators. So what we're trying to do is build an OS that has operational experience in it. Um, and to kind of you know, give you what you need when you're blurry eyed at 3 a.m. and you're waking up from an outage and you need to see what you need to see very quickly so that you can hone in and isolate the problem. Um, the other thing that we've been doing uh, for the past few years is we've been really focusing on cloud native architectures. We're gonna get into that in detail there's a reason why we're calling our, our OS the Cloud Native Network OS. Um, and, and we're really, really focused on, on native support because we think going forward that the folks that are choosing their environments their, to do the replication of what's in the cloud, they're gonna say it needs to be on a non-proprietary open orchestration layer. And it's really, really critical that they have the entire infrastructure controlled in that similar type of way with those similar tools. Uh, we, we see how a lot of other folks are doing it when they say, hey, I support Kubernetes. What, it, what they really mean is I got a proprietary product and I've got a bolt-on and I run Kubernetes to see you know, what's going on underneath and I look at the containers and I see where they are and, and I get a lot of data about that. But what they don't see is native control of their network primitives using those cloud native tools. And we'll, we'll get into that in detail. Um, and lastly, uh, as Tom mentioned before, we, we uh, launched our product two days ago. <laughs> so uh, it's really, really fresh, uh, and we're super excited. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of context about what the problems we're trying to solve. We're, we're not looking to have you know, a new version of BGP that uh, you know, converges to, you know, 2% faster than anything else. Uh, we're not looking to rewrite the control plane and rewrite everything from a from a, you know, a routing perspective, we're really focused on the management layers to solve the day two operations, right? So, so what we're solving for is you know, bringing faster time to service for folks. Uh, you know, it, we're having enhanced security and compliance. We're gonna get into how we do that, right? This is a lot of the, the benefits from containerization. But the, the whole crux of everything is simplifying you know, runtime operations. Day two operations is what we call it occasionally. It's, it's really focused on, hey, we think the network uh, universe has solved the day one problem of getting stuff out the door, you know, provisioning and, and doing sort of the initial kick, but there's a, still a big gap in how do I run these networks? How do I, how do I automate and orchestrate my runtime of these networks? Yeah, any, anyone who's had to go through the painful process of an upgrade of a chassis or, uh, 
3 a.m. and everything goes, you know, as smooth as possible. Oh, we missed this one step or this 30-page mop didn't have this one detail in there. We'll understand this pain. So uh, real quick, the, the things that we're, we're doing to, to actually accomplish this is with the containerized microservice platform, embedded Kubernetes. So we actually, we're going to show you the architecture here in just a moment uh, where we take in, uh, Kubernetes outside of this you know, clustered system and we make it work on an embedded system because the, the operating system is fully containerized and needs this orchestration layer to manage these containers. Yep. Um, you know, we've got real-time telemetry. Uh, this object-specific uh, monitoring, it, it's really, really sound stingy. Like on here, it's like really long words, but it's super magical. And Adam's gonna show you how it works. Mm -hmm. um, it's using Kubernetes Watch. And if anybody's played with Kubernetes Watch, making it work in the network for network primitives is actually really, really neat. And we're going to show you how that works. Um, and, and, I, and, and, and I have CLI up here, which is going to make some people go groan and say, oh, we're still doing CLIs. Uh, and then it's going to make other people go, oh, great. OK, so I don't have to learn Kubernetes. And, and that's exactly what I want. That's exactly what we're, what we're going for, is we're, we're bridging the gap between DevOps and NetOps by giving NetOps folks the CLI that they're used to, yeah. but, but abstracting away all the interesting cloud-native microservice containerization, how many buzzwords can I fit in a sentence, Kubernetes stuff, right? So it's, it's really important to us that we, that we bring a tool chain that can bridge the gaps between NetOps and DevOps, because that's really what we're all about. Yeah, and, and in reality, it's not a separate interface, as you would think. It sits on top of the API and ingests the CRDs that are actually, uh, that we register with the, the Kubernetes API how that, how that functions. So we're talking very fast to get to the demo because we know that's what you guys want. Mm -hmm. um, so so how, how do we, you know, what, what do we have to do to do this, right? And, and this, is, this is, this slide, you know, should, it's a wrecking ball. It shows you, you know, breaking up the monolith into a bunch of containers and, and you know, we've got Kubernetes and Docker and, and a cool CLI on the right. Um, the whole point of, of explaining it this way, and the, the thing I really want you to take away is that we couldn't solve the <clears throat> problems that we're trying to solve by putting more layers of management and abstraction in the network OS. It was super critical to solve this problem to go back to the core of the network OS and say, how do we fundamentally change the architecture in the network OS yep. to, to enable us to do what we want to do? And that's, he'll show you everything about it, but that's where we had to break it into containers, <clears throat> integrate Kubernetes, and make it work you know, for operators. Yeah. Do you want to go over the... Yeah, I can. I mean, this is, this is a, a high-level version of our architecture, but we can go into detail of what it actually this means, right? And anyone, ask questions. If you want to know anything more, feel free to go at it. Um, so core to our management functionality and the main interface into our device is the Kubernetes API. So we've taken Kube API, put it on the system, and had it uh, basically be the front end for any interaction from a user standpoint. Uh, on top of that, we put a CLI that sits on top of there that I was just talking about that ingests any of the uh, APIs that have been created in the Kubernetes API to go ahead and actually build a Yang hierarchy of the CLI that could be utilized for other tools in the future, potentially, um, and allow people to basically get that look and feel that they're you know, comfortable with from a traditional network device. Um, so what does that actually mean in, in, you know, in reality? So we've containerized every aspect of the OS where we thought it made sense. So that means that if we have a particular network service that's running or a particular infrastructure piece, if it made sense to put that in a co container or co-locate it in a, in a container, we've done that. And why would we do something like that? Why would we go ahead and take network pieces and then put them into a container and to have them sitting there? Well, there's a couple reasons. One is now you have the ability, if you want to, to only run a slimmer set of features and functionality you actually want on the device. That doesn't mean shutting down these particular modules that might be sitting in the code or something like that. It's actually removing the code completely. If you destroy a, a particular container that's running, that container's gone, removed from the box, that code isn't running on the system anymore. And as an operator, you have access to this. Correct. Like you, you can pick and choose the code that is running. Absolutely, yes. And we'll, we'll show that and how you can go ahead and reduce reduce that set and go from there. You actually could create and put your own container on there. And since we follow very strictly the Open API version 3 specification that's laid out in Kubernetes, so basically the Swagger spec, if you come with a CRD or a custom resource definition to register that, that will register with, this, with our API and our CLI will pick that up. So uh, kind of a neat thing from that standpoint from an extensibility piece. Uh, we leverage heavily, uh, as I was talking about, CRDs, so custom resource definitions within Kubernetes. So every service that we create, or every service that's come from SnapRoute or a third party, we've made it into a native Kubernetes controller. 
So essentially what that means is that there's a, a control loop that's running to ensure that the state that we've declared for that particular system is always going to be the state that's going to be running in the network. So if we have you know, you know, a piece of config and that state's been put on there, there's a control loop ensuring that's always going to be the state that's going to be managing on the network. So if anything changes, it still tries to get back to that state. If, if a service fails, it automatically tries to restart if anything goes wrong from that perspective, just as you would in the cloud native world when you're running a distributed system. Um, so we can talk about each one of the, the protocol suites that we, we have from there, but let's look at telemetry just for a second. We utilize telemetry to some aspect, and we'll show this on there. And the way we're doing this today is that we're leveraging some aspects of Kubernetes Watch, which essentially means you're subscribing to the REST API of Kubernetes, and if any object changes, changes that you're watching, you get a streaming update of that object. So for example, if I was watching, let's say, you know, a BGP peer status or the BGP peers, if any changes happen to those BGP peers, I get an update for it. Instantly. So think of it as a much better, better constructed SNMP uh, trap or NFCOM notification. And you're not limited to anything in the system. So if it exists as an object in Kubernetes, you can go ahead and watch it. If it's in the Kube API as a CRD, you can watch it. Config, state, doesn't matter. Um, so what we do with that, we use something called uh, the SNAP telemetry framework. It's an open source project that exists out there. Uh, it was started by Intel initially. And we have that running in a container on the box. And we go ahead and leverage some of the watch functionality on there for those items. And you can actually pick which particular um, variables you want from that object and have it streamed out to a central location. So one of the things that I'm going to show in the demo that, we're, that we do from that perspective is that I'm actually watching some BGP NLRIs. And so when an NLRI changes, we'll actually get an update to see what actually happened. So uh, rather than actually getting, you know, trying to pull it or something like that, we'll just get a streaming update. I have it showed in Recover Fauna, and we'll just see that action happen right there. So just giving you a small window into some of the, 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 the goodness that you can get when you have functionality like that. Question about Go watch. for it. Um, do you out of the box sort of have everything turned on in watch or everything turned off and you have to sort of customize it or do you have a sort of small set of things already on? Sure. So we have actually we, everything by default at the current moment is off, right? And then you can go and configure how you want. So. Um, YAML is the name of the game in many cases, or you can use the config file that gets created by the CLI. But if you want to, you can go and specify exactly what object you want and then what prims you want in that, and then you can go and send that out. Uh, the two versions we support today to send that is either Influx or Prometheus. So we also can run, and we do in some cases where it can be handy, a local Influx DB instance on the box, if you, if you so choose. Uh, I'm not doing that in this particular case, but that's certainly something. And the reason why we do things like that is, as anyone knows who's run a network, that you know you might be sending everything to a centralized location until that centralized you know, uh, connection that you have fails, and then you lose whatever window you had in that period of time when the device went down. So it's like, well, I know something stopped at you know 12:55, and then the device went down six minutes later. What happened between there? No clue. So that's why we make sure that you can have a way to actually store stuff locally and in a time series database that you actually can go and manage and look at. Um, okay, so I have these little items sitting over here uh, for you know declaring like you know platform Linux uh, kernel and data plane. We actually use Yocto as our base Linux operating system. Uh, we didn't want to get into the religious discussion about whether we you know were Red Hat or Debian or, or any of those items when we're working with a customer running Yocto. You want to run a particular tool set on a device, go load a container on there, have at it, feel free. That's, that's all totally up to you. Um, and it's just a plain vanilla kernel. We're not doing any modifications to it or anything special. Uh, we leverage some of the functionality that exists in there too, like VRFs and things like that as well. Um, okay, we have our, our own, uh, so we actually do, you know, abstract the hardware away. We leverage ONLP for this case. Everyone knows about Open Network Linux. We take actually the Open Network Linux platform layer out of it, do some modification to it, put it in a container, and use that as our abstraction layer for underlying hardware. We don't really like ONL, but we actually like ONLP. So when I think oh, that's- Oh, that's not nice to say. Steve yeah. Noble, we love you. Yes, we love you, Steve. <laughs> it's just too big, it's just too big, because we've got to put Kubernetes on the box. Well, yeah, there's a few different reasons. Resource, resourcing uh, is one of them. Um, I mean, I don't need everything under the sun in Linux well, on a network device. I don't need to have a GUI. I don't need mouse drivers. I'm good with just having it slimmed down as I need it. Um, and so we just found that, that that was better for us for, and thing we believe better for operators from that particular perspective. And since you can put everything containerized on there, off you go. Uh, additionally, you can do things like interactive device like you would another cloud native device, whether that be Helm, whether that be uh, you know, Fluent D or another particular open source product that exists out there that's in the cloud native universe, you can go ahead and leverage it and we use it. We use Fluent D as one, one mechanism to do uh, log aggregation in our particular case. And you can specify, hey, here are the logs from containers, and hey, here are the logs from the actual system. And you can segment those out if you need to. 